project you can. What's interesting is even if you make a good project, there's no guarantee it's ever going to be seen or released. So I just happened to be in, the, in this gem that ended up getting seen. So now it's about uh, going and making some uh, some great movies. I mean, here's I mean, here's the thing. Uh, who here is an actor? Okay. So who here is a director? Okay. Anyone here consider themselves uh, uh, just a filmmaker in general? Okay. So that probably accounts for about 60% of this audience. We all know that we've created some shit in our lives. Okay. The Room is a film that has gotten, been self-distributed, was a produced, created, took years of multiple people's lives, and if nothing else, has an amazing cult following, and what probably millions of people have enjoyed in one way or another, and I think, I, ha I mean, it's not necessarily the way that you wanted to make it so far, but you are well known, and you have a book, and you are a, a very intelligent, wonderful person to have, right? Yeah. 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 And, have, uh, and are well known throughout the at least, well, the United States and London. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's weird. With The Room, I didn't really expect anything from it. I was just kind of helping a friend try to make his movie. So for something that I just kind of did when I was 24, I guess, can't really complain. And it's, you know, it's probably you guys here. It's made you guys laugh. So, um, yeah, what's wrong with that? And it's been an amazing experience. Yeah, that's definitely I true. Know, I can't believe that I'm defending The Room, but I am. <laughs> yeah. Greg, how, um, if at all, would you say the release of the book has affected your relationship with Tommy? Because, I mean, he's always struck me as a very private person, and obviously there's a lot of personal stuff in the book, so is that something where you feel that your relationship with him has changed at all? Um, we guess in the back end, you hear that? <laughs> a lot of the stuff that I wrote about in there, um, I interviewed him about. I left out a lot of stuff that would have been too personal and I felt like would have kind of gone too far to take away from the whole mystery of the film. Because my goal with the book was to tell the, you know, the, the inspiring story behind it and as well make it a more of an enjoyable experience for you guys. Um, so I, my relationship with him, is it's great. I mean, initially when it first came out, I think... It was weird for him to kind of have the spotlight on the book and, and not so much on the, on the movie. But um, he's come around, uh, he's been supportive, and um, I think, you know, having known him as long as I have, 15 years, we've kind of been through Vietnam together, um, you know, I think there'll always be a, a special bond there, so. Awesome. Yes? Do you still want to do any acting? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, this was something that just kind of skewed on this crazy tangent, um, and I've embraced it, and I feel like kind of writing the book and saying a little bit more about who I am and how I got involved in all this is kind of a step, you know, in a, in a different direction. Yes. Yeah, how much of the Pierre scenes in the book are legitimate? Like, how reliable a narrator is Tommy about his, his past? Um... It's a little floaty. Uh, <laughs> used to, a lot of those stories stayed pretty consistent during the time that I knew them, and they checked out when I traveled to those places and did more research. Um, and some of the stuff I feel like is his view on the experience, which makes it even more interesting because it's kind of like Kaiser Soze. You just kind of wonder the hell, well, you know, what's it all about. But um, a lot of that stuff I feel like stayed consistent and it's true to his story. What's your favorite directional quote from Tommy? If you want to be actor, act like one. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> yes. I, I'm um, blessed that I got to see the snippet that I did. Um, it's, I think it's what Rob, Rob Reed does just say. If he's a producer. Um, I, I he's hope he releases it. it. He's like, my god, you talk about my movie? <laughs> uh, it's just, yeah, it's almost like watching Bigfoot prowl cars in a Los Angeles neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine that. <laughs> yes. Um, Tommy, 
his new work, what do you enjoy best? Of his newest stuff? What's tough about what he's done recently is he's not, he hasn't been in charge of it. Like, he hasn't directed it and written it. So I, I feel like there's a veil of kind of playing off the, in, you know, the intentional comedy. Um, shoot, I don't even know. Maybe um, the house of trips blood on Alex, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's more of him and his element, but I, I just I prefer I love when Tommy writes his own material. <laughs> As you can tell, for any any of you who heard that script, <laughs> what? that's uh, that's right up my alley. <laughs> yes. Uh, what happened in the scene where you guys were playing football in the alley and tackled that one guy? Was that Tommy's plan? Yeah, it was in the script that I like grab him and push him into a trash can <laughs> aggressively, and then there was a part in the script where I had to like massage his knee to make him better. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's let's not go there. He's like, Danny, take him home. Yeah, if you need, call me anytime. It just sounded like it was heading in the wrong direction. <laughs> you know what? I've got a question. Um, there, and uh, I have to apologize because uh, I have not read your book yet. Oh, uh, I know, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, certain friends of mine got advanced copies. I never got an advanced copy, so. Uh, <laughs> thanks. That's I just my, got, a series, I see, got a series of Facebook messages. Please, can we do a screen in the room and, and bring my book? Yes, we can make that happen. But uh, one of the most bizarre aspects, I think, of the film. Um, uh, Across the border are all the sex scenes. Uh, Same here. Okay. And, and you did delve uh, into some of the description, like the opening uh, uh, sex scene, or not sex scene, the uh, buttock scene, the first buttock scene. Uh, we'll call it buttock exhibit A. Uh, but Lisa only filmed one sex scene, which is used twice in the film. <laughs> with Tommy. Um, could you, could you offer any explanation as to why that was only filmed once? Um, it was shot for a very long time. <laughs> it went on and on and on, and I felt like Tommy really was trying to get across that they had sex a lot. <laughs> so he had so much footage, he figured why not throw in an, another sex scene and have it, you know, showcase that Lisa's great when he can get it. Because <laughs> in that scene, he's like, my Lisa's great when I can get it. I was like, dude, you get it in every <laughs> So, but he uh, figured that footage when you know would go unnoticed that it was just another round of passion between Johnny and Lisa, and those rose petals. Oh man. Um. Uh, yep. Yeah, rose petals. Uh, 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 my favorite scene. I'm sorry, it's the scene that you're not in. Is the doggy scene. <laughs> that has to be just be the greatest scene I think in the whole movie. <laughs> It's, yeah, I think it's, it's the moment in the film when you know you're witnessing something special. <laughs> uh, it's, you watch the scene kind of, they compete over each other, like, who can say the line the fastest, and then you, like, the lines are dubbed, and then randomly you just, like, pets the dog and breaks the fourth wall, and it's just, you just want to stand up and applaud. <laughs> everyone in this audience to stand sure, up and applaud. Something. And the dog steals the show. I mean, he's the best actor in the whole movie. <laughs> uh, actually, so in the process of making this movie, uh, did you do a lot of ADR work? After yes, this? yes, after uh, the movie was shot. Certainly moments where the uh, it does not match up at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely audio challenged. Uh, the, the sound guy that was working on the film, I, I don't know if it was his first sound job or his first job in general, uh, but he was reading the manual in between takes of the sound equipment. So that was that was an like there are forty graduates from Columbia College in this room right now. We're gonna all do that. Yeah, no, so I knew we were off to it. They, they had to do some fights, like the DP was like, you know, the, the sound is not working, and they got into a fight, and Tommy's like, calm down, people, come on. Um, and so, yeah, the sound needed to be re-recorded, and Tommy was big on uh, perfecting the accent to make sure that when he re-recorded the lines, it sounded more American. <laughs> <laughs> My dialogue needed to be re-recorded, the phone conversations, 
When I had to say, sure, baby, come on up, I want your body. I did not think those lines would ever be heard, so I, I put as much cheese whiz on them as possible. And they work perfectly, but yeah, the sound, uh, that's one of probably the best parts of the movie is the ADR. Watching the mouths not sync up. Uh, how, uh, how long was the shooting process overall? It was quite a while. It was almost as long as it took to shoot Transformers. <laughs> it was about six months, I think, something right, right around six months. So. Because, and you, I mean, you constantly had new crews coming in. Yeah, I mean, it was like we shot the Chris R scene in the alley, this like indoor alley set, and then on the way to, you know, on the way to the shoot, Tommy's like, you know what, we need to reshoot Chris R. It needs to be big, big idea, Al Capone, the gun fly out, like a car fly off a roof, like going on and on. So we ended up going to set and just shooting this Chris R scene on the rooftop for like two weeks. <laughs> and so it would just kind of go like that. If Tommy had a creative idea, it would just go in that direction. And randomly one day, he's like, we shoot tuxedo so with football, park. the wedding, you shave. So every day was kind of, every day was kind Why of an they film adventure it? on Why how this movie was going to go. At some point, I realized it probably was never going to end. Just what happened with he added scenes in, this, the scenes in San Francisco were never yeah, really in the script. I had just broken up with my girlfriend and we were getting ready to shoot the exteriors in San Francisco, he's like, let's do scene, talk about your girlfriend, how's your sex life? <laughs> and I was like, oh God, he's just gonna keep adding scenes, we don't know this thing. The dog was the last scene we shot, how perfect. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, question for Greg. Do you have any I plans? I suppose to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Do you have any plans for doing uh, an audio book? Because I would love to hear you read it, especially the way you use Tommy's voice. <laughs> I um, I'd love to do an audio book. It's it's in the works. Um, I talked to Tommy about maybe having him read his part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He wants like a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, um, Scotch Guy. Scotch Guy. Is this something that Tommy actually drinks? Or was it just, oh, this is a good idea, I'm gonna make Scotch and vodka and it'll work? I think that's, that's his idea of what people drink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, You've known him obviously a lot. I've, I've I've had multiple dinners with with Don Ruzzo. Um, he doesn't drink. No, he doesn't drink. Johnny doesn't drink in real life. I love it. Yeah, I, I've never seen him drink except for a few sips of wine. Yeah, that's about the extent. Yeah, and, and, and blood. Yeah. Uh, Lambert. Yes. Uh, in the book, there's a moment where when when Tommy asks you to shave. Well, I think The Room is autobiographical. I think it's really kind of his view of human interaction with a combination of life experience. And I felt like it was kind of symbolizing a real moment in our friendship to put that in there between Johnny and Mark. Um, I was just petrified to shave my beard because then there went my disguise. So <laughs> I, uh, I looked uh, pretty terrified in that scene. I don't, I don't, I don't even think I raise my arms when I have to do the whole cheap, cheap thing. <laughs> I left that performance at home, to put it kindly. I, I like the, using the phrase, Tom, this is how Tommy believes humans are. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, yes. Let's just circle back to the sex scenes. <laughs> That's nice. Where did the sound music come from? <laughs> it's all original. <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, Tommy originally wanted Bon Jovi always. <laughs> he wanted a journey open arms for my scene. But I think they asked for too much money. He said, go to hell, we don't need Bon Jovi. So he just pulled these kids out of like East LA to come in and write songs. And they did that, exactly that. And you know, now we have You Are My Rose. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Which I think just fits perfectly. Bon Jovi, I think, would have committed suicide. <laughs> When uh, the first, when we first started doing screenings of the room, uh, we received uh, four gigantic cases of the soundtrack to hand out to everyone as they came in. Um, I'm sure they all listened to it too. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they did. Yes. Uh, why didn't Johnny's flying vampire car make it into the final film? That would have been a great plot twist. I thought it would have been brilliant. Um, originally, for people that didn't hear, uh, Tommy had the idea that Johnny might be a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Which totally was quite a banker. <laughs> so the green screen was going to be torn down because the owner's like, I'm tired of this shit shooting in my parking lot. It's affecting my business. And Tommy's like, wait, wait, I have an idea why we have it. Let's have my car fly off. And then the DP looked at him like, oh my god, this is so freaking insane. And so he talked him out of it, um, gave him all sorts of excuses why it couldn't happen. Tommy looked like, you know, really sad, like a 12 year old boy. Um, and we just had to move on because of time, but god, that would have been so brilliant. It would have made, it would have made the movie make so much more sense. <laughs> What I love is that, like, every second we answer a question, like, as soon as we answer a question, five more hands, like, that just gave me five more, I don't understand what's going on. Uh, yes. Um, have you played the room game, and how do you like it? Um, yes, I have, and I thought it was tremendous. I, I always thought, God, a room video game, what would you do? And I think they really nailed it. That's <laughs> great. Um, literally, I just saved that original script because um, it was the most amazing document I'd ever read. <laughs> uh, for now, it's just fun for readings. I don't know, that's kind of Tommy's call. But I think for humanity, it really should. <laughs> um, all right. You guys in the front. All right. Bye. Go okay. Um, Greg, um, there, uh, in Phil Haldeman's comic, he, uh, he says that the first thing he auditioned for, for Tommy, was The Neighbors. So does that mean that the pre-production for The Neighbors began before pre-production for The Room? No, The, the Room was, was Tommy's brainchild. I think um, he kind of he got hooked on the whole sitcom idea, and he was throwing that around. But it was, it was always really The Room. I think The, the Neighbors was just kind of like a, his take on Friends. <laughs> so, I don't know where that ties in, but um, yeah, that was always the room originally. Uh, Alright, so we know what Tommy Wiseau's favorite film is, Citizen Kane. What is your favorite film and what is your favorite good, bad film? Okay. Uh, my favorite film would probably be Back to the Future. Yeah! yeah. Just so you guys know, Chris Glover is coming to the Music Box Theater at the end of January. <laughs> Uh, I wish I was here for that. Uh, hey, come back. Let's do a double feature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you seen any of his films? Oh, no, his no, no, no. So I've he's, read about them. Though. So he's, he's doing his second film, and then he's he's screening his second film, he's doing his slideshow, but then he's also doing uh, 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 preview parts of the new film that he's made, wow. the third, which, if you've n anyone ever seen Crispin Glover's films? Yes, yes. yes. Holy fuck. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of a Wazoian <laughs> concept in there yes. somewhere along the way. Anyway. Um, favorite band. And favorite, I'd probably say, I don't know if it's kind of a random one, it's called Johnny Suede. If you guys are, yeah, it's, it moves like molasses. It's really, you gotta be in the right mood for it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. But I haven't seen, I haven't seen a lot of like the whole good bad movies, like Troll 2 or anything like that, so I gotta catch up on it. I'm kind of guessing that some of the people in this audience are probably in the quote unquote right mood to watch a movie like that. Yeah, Johnny Swade is really different. 1991, it's one of Brad Pitt's earlier movies. Um, it's, it's out there. Yeah, it's different. Okay. Yes. Uh, Tommy Wiseau approached you to do another film with him. Uh, would you agree? And if so, what kind of film would you want to do? Oh, okay. you know, I, what I'd love to do with Tommy is I'd love to help him. Like what, a, what I was originally trying to do with the room is help him make it and not be in it. 
I took one for the team, but um, <laughs> yeah, he's got a movie called The Foreclosure that he wants to make. It's about the housing market. It's another family movie uh, where he loses, he loses his house and he goes to the bank with a shotgun to get it back. <laughs> So I would love to help him make that because I think uh, I feel like I need to for you guys because it is the script is just tremendous. I mean, honestly, the room, the neighbors, and the foreclosure. There's always a B. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, uh, yes. So going back to the sex scene. <laughs> I think Tommy watched a lot of romantic films and thought that's the way people do it. <laughs> this is the way humans interact. What's amazing about the sex scenes, though, is normally like you feature the woman because that's kind of what we all want to see. But poor Juliet Danielle is just like plastered on a bed, and all you see is Tommy's hair going everywhere, His butt that looks like a dinosaur or something. <laughs> That's what makes it so crazy to watch. It's like it's just. I mean, you, you do have to be careful. There are probably people who are videotaping this and uploading this directly to YouTube. Uh, who's going to see it? Yeah. Um, well, I've kind of let him know what I think about the sex. <laughs> you he, did, said, he said it's all for fun, so it's good. And you did say that uh, he did have his ass airbrushed. Um. I th yeah, his ass is so perfect, you don't really need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Alright, as a person who's never seen this movie before, get out. Get out. <laughs> get out. <laughs> yeah, put your seatbelt on. Um, prepare to experience something you've never seen before. Do you need some spoons? Yes. Get your spoons ready. Okay, here, here are a couple things <laughs> um, about watching it in this theater. We do a monthly screening of this film. Um, we clean up a lot of spoons. Uh, we've tried to recycle and resell them. People don't buy used spoons. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, if anything ever hits the screen, that's a $40,000 expenditure that the music box cannot possibly afford right now, so please don't hit anything and throw anything at the screen. Tell your friends not to fuck up the screen. Um, other things, are, so those who have not uh, participated uh, and those that have participated, uh, every time the Golden Gate Bridge is seen on, on screen, what do we do? Go, 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 go. Um, other, uh, other things that people want to remind You're us. You're a wizard, Harry! <laughs> You're a wizard, Harry? Is this a new one? You guys are a woman! Did you guys know the whole one, two, fuck it? Yeah. <laughs> Dresser, so when he's up there, he's like, screw, screw the whole world. He goes, he takes one drawer out, second drawer out, and then throws it over. So like, one, two, fuck, fuck it. it. <laughs> yes. Also, yeah. There's also a, there's a Fight Club reference in a screening I saw in Kansas City. Uh, in the opening scene, they're like, first rule of Pillow Fight Club, you don't talk about Fight Club. And then Danny comes on the bed, I don't know, it was, it was a great one, so keep your eye open for that. Um, people tend to clap along to the sex scenes. <laughs> what What's that? What candles? What candles? Oh, yeah. What sex is let put my evil inside you. <laughs> no spancer. No spancer. When Tommy waves at the camera, you wave back. Oh yeah, you wave back, <laughs> <Yeah>, Tommy. <laughs> uh, anything else for a newbie who's never seen it? Be wild in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. What was that last one? There's another uh, part of the movie that blows my mind. Uh, I'm sure you guys have probably seen it. In the, in the alley scene when Johnny and Mike have the whole underwear talk. Um, if you notice, the alley is enclosed. So it's like just a wall all like that. And Johnny is just walking straight towards the wall. So there's nowhere really to go. And if Mike 
drop him, he's going to walk right into the brick wall. I noticed that the last time. I thought it was pretty brilliant. <laughs> How many